Then let's ask the Lord for a blessing upon the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Gracious God and Father, your word holds remarkable truth. Glorious and wonderful light shines from it. But that light cannot pierce the darkness of our hearts or our eyes unless you first bless us with your spirit. So before we even open your word, we ask, Lord, open our eyes, open our hearts by your Spirit, dwell in us, that when we hear your word proclaimed, our hearts may be moved and we may renew our trust in you, or even put our trust in you for the very first time. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 27, that's again page 991. Page 900 in your pew Bibles, 991. We're going to read the verses 32 and then 256. With the verses 32 through 44 as our text this Sunday. Uh, Next Sunday, we actually have Reverend Brian Najafor uh, leading us in worship in the morning. And I'm going to be leading the HRC of Jordan uh, in worship on that morning. So it'll be uh, April 2nd uh, before we come back to Matthew 27, verse 45 to the end. And then April 7th, we're going to consider 1 Corinthians 1. We preach Christ and Him crucified. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to consider Acts 17, a portion of Acts 17. But today we're going to read from Matthew 27, beginning at verse 32, and we'll read to verse 56. Hear the word of God. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there and over his head, They put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And two robbers who were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now that's our text, but we'll read what we're going to consider on April 2nd which is the verses 45 through 56. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which is, uh, or that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed And gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him Keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There are also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Thus for the reading of God's holy word. Again, our text, the verses 32 through 44.
Brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we come in our study now of the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to passages that focus our attention very clearly on Jesus and on what Jesus endured. We have thus far looked into the mirror of God's law, as, or God's Word rather, as we've been studying uh, Matthew 27. We've looked at ourselves. We've, we've tried to see ourselves in the Word of God, in the carelessness, in the cruelty, in the rebellion of the people that were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus. But now we want to shift a little, and we want to see not ourselves, first of all. We want to see Jesus, and we want to see what He endured in the events of His crucifixion, which is a difficult thing to do, make no mistake. And we don't want to be too... Um, bold. We don't want to think that we can, in some way, enter into the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ. We can't. And indeed, that's some of the point, isn't it? Jesus suffered so that we wouldn't have to. And it is impossible, surely, for us to understand His suffering, His burden. He was the perfect, beloved Son of God. We are imperfect, rebellious children who deserve any judgment we get. But he didn't deserve any of it. So his weight of of sorrow and grief was greater than anything we'll ever experience. But we still want to be able to see something of it. We still want to be able at least maybe not enter into the suffering, but stand a bit back, maybe with these women that we read about in Matthew 27, Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. We We want to stand back for a moment. We want to observe what Jesus is enduring and we want to make some sense of it. We want to understand it. Understand it as Matthew presents it to us. And Matthew presents it to us in a very careful way. He doesn't go on and on about the pain, certainly not the physical pain that in Jesus endured. Jesus' death is presented very prosaically, very simply in all of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all just very simply say, and they crucified him. There isn't a lot of description. There's not a lot of going into the details of Jesus' gruesome death, the physical side of it. They, They don't enter into a description of all of that. But they do describe for us something of the emotional or the mental the spiritual, certainly, burden that Jesus endured. They don't talk so much about the physical pain, but they do talk, even as we've already heard today, about Jesus' burden within His Spirit when He cried out, My God, My God, why have You forsaken Me? That, that's an emotional, that's a spiritual, that's an, a mental cry to the living God. Because the greatest burden that Jesus bore on the cross of Calvary was not, first of all, the physical pain of the nails that went through his hands and feet, the whips that tore his back, that crown of thorns that pierced his brow. The greatest burden is what we just sang from in Psalm 42. Separation from God. Isolation from the blessedness of life. Indeed, that that is also for us, I think. When we experience it, that is the greatest burden that we have in this life. There are many burdens we carry in this life. I think the heaviest, the heaviest is loneliness, isolation, separation. It's when a relationship ends or breaks. It's when loved ones are angry at us, when we find ourselves by ourselves in a moment having to bear up under great strain. When we suffer alone, we suffer some of the heaviest burdens of this life. Now try to imagine suffering alone like Jesus did, not for anything you've done, but for what other people have done. That increases, doesn't it? That increases the weight of this event. I mean, imagine your family, your friends, your church community 
hearing a rumor about you. It's not true. It's maliciously made up by somebody to make you look bad. But all the congregation believes it. And you come into church and, and, and you sense people are looking at me funny. They're whispering behind me. They're quiet when I come into their, into their presence. What's going on? What, what, what have I done? And there's nothing you can do. Everybody believes it's true of you. You're bearing this burden not for anything that you've done, but for the cruelty of another. Or maybe it's because of a partner, a, a, a spouse that is being unfaithful to you. Maybe it's a child that is rebelling against you. Maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's a parent that is embarrassing. A parent that is, is, is not a good or godly person. And as a child, you go to school and you're embarrassed about dad and mom. You're suffering. You don't invite your friends over. You don't enjoy the blessings that they enjoy because of dad who who drinks too much or who's got a temper or whatever sin it may be. That's a heavy burden. That's a loneliness. You can be in the crowd of all the children on the playground, but you can still feel in that moment lonely. Because loneliness is very burdensome. It is, I think, at times the heaviest burden we'll bear. And Jesus in our text bears it. That's what we want to see together this morning. We want to see how Jesus suffers being rejected completely by His creatures. We'll see next time how He's rejected by God. We'll see something of that. But now He's rejected by His society, His community, His disciples, His people, His world. And we're going to run over these verses 32-44 through uh, three times. We're just going to run over them again and again and again. And we're going to see how, how Jesus is rejected and what that means as He hangs there on the cross. We're going to see how He's rejected by every strata, every part of society. And then we're going to see Again, that he's rejected, but that he's rejected as the king of the Jews. And then we're going to see how there is in this a principle that is revealed in all of Scripture, one that we have to deal with. So we're going to see that Jesus suffers fully, a full rejection by his creation, by his creatures. And we're going to see that in the first place by noting as we read through the verses 32 through 44, all those things that happen that indicate this rejection. How the soldiers at the very beginning have to press Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. They have to compel him. There's no one willing to help Jesus. There's no one who sees this man in all of his broken physical weariness in all of his pain and suffering as he's walking carrying the beam that he would be crucified upon to the hill where they're going to kill him and as he stumbles and falls as he's weak in his body unable to carry this cross no one steps up no one says I'll do it let me help my savior let me bear his burden for a moment nobody is willing to suffer with Jesus. They have to force, compel, twist the arm of. They grab Simon and they say, You have to do it under order of the Roman legion. Because nobody is there to carry this burden with Jesus. And the mocking and the, and the rejection of Jesus continues. He comes to the place of Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. And there they offer him wine to drink mixed with gall. That was a, a, an act of cruelty. It was an act that was meant to, to cause Jesus greater suffering. To make his life more difficult. It was meant not to give him relief, but to give him pain. And it's the soldiers that are 
doing this to him. The state, the government, the society of which Jesus is a part is not protecting him, is not defending him, is not showing him mercy. No, they are mocking him. They are destroying him. Indeed, they divide his garment among them by casting lots. They they see him merely as a source for their good fortune. We get to rob from him. We get to take from him what he has, the very little that he owns. And the people around him, the people that were to love him, the people that should have at least been merciful to him, his own Israelite citizens, they reject him. Not only does the state, not only does this, do the soldiers reject him, those robbers who would have probably been Jews as well, Romans could not be crucified, so they weren't Romans, and given that this is outside of Jerusalem, it stands to reason they would have been Jews. They mock Jesus. The people that walk by, who are coming out of the city or going into the city on this day of uh, Passover, on this feast day, there would have been lots and lots of Israelites coming and going. They're mocking Him. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself, they say. The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders mock Him. He saved others. He cannot save Himself. The robbers revile Him in the same way. All levels of society are implicated here. All elements of society are mocked, are mocking Jesus. He's mocked by the mighty. He's mocked by the dying. He is mocked by His people. He's mocked by His fellow criminals. He is mocked relentlessly. No one stands to defend Him. No one comes to His aid. And we know, especially in the words of the following verses, that Jesus is also suffering the profound rejection of God so that we can say that in this moment He is utterly rejected. That He is outside of the camp. That He is outside of Jerusalem on the hill of the skull. He is despised by men. He is forsaken by the Father. He is plunged in this moment into the deepest darkest darkness that anyone has ever experienced in this life. He is utterly alone here. And there is something in that that ought to encourage us, especially in our moments of isolation. When we feel, when we experience the weight of loneliness in this life, and we will all experience it, it is a part of this life. When we experience the weight of loneliness, burdening our hearts, burdening our spirits, then you can come to this Savior who knows what you're going through better than you ever will. He knows what it's like to be mistreated. He knows what it's like to be despised. He knows what it's like to be rejected by those who love you or who are to love you. He knows perfectly what you're experiencing when you're experiencing that separation, that grief, that sorrow. But this this friend, this Savior, will never forsake you, will never leave you. He will always make His presence felt, and He will always love you deeply. Come to this Savior in your moments of isolation and experience His presence. That's one of the encouragements of this event, of this passage. But it's an encouragement only because, only because of the redemptive work that this moment is accomplishing. That is, it's not just that Jesus is experienced isolation that makes him such a good savior, that makes him such a good mediator for us. It's not simply that he knows what you're going through better than you do. That's true that's not just it. That's not enough, really. It's not enough for Jesus to say, I know what you're going through, if He can do nothing about it. Sometimes we we need people who have gone through the paths that we are walking to walk alongside us and to say, I know what you're going through. There's such an encouragement when somebody's been down the path we're going down to hear from them, to be blessed by them. There is a real encouragement in that. But it's not enough 
We need strength. We need help. We need deliverance. We need victory. We need Jesus to do something. Not just suffer for us, but save us. And that's exactly what He's doing in this moment. He's suffering precisely because this is the burden our sin deserves. Remember that sin in its deepest misery and shame isolates. That's what it wants to do to you. When you are tempted today in this week, when sin comes and says, join us, know that it's isolating you. It's cutting you off. Just go back to the Garden of Eden and remember the story there. Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit. What's the first thing that happens? They're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They're naked. So they get fig leaves. They're no longer one. There isn't that harmony between them anymore. And then what do they do? They hide from each other and from God. Because that's what sin does. Isn't that our own experience? Isn't that something we, we understand? When we do something wrong, and mom and dad come and find out about it, and they, and they come to us and they sit us down and they say, okay, now tell us what you've done. Then we're embarrassed, aren't we? We're ashamed. We're guilty. We're even afraid of what the punishment will be. And so maybe we try and lie and we try and hide it and we try and we make the matter worse, don't we? All of a sudden, mom and dad, who they were bothered by the, the thing that we did when we weren't nice to our brother or sister, when we broke that thing we weren't supposed to touch, They're bothered by that to start. But now they're hurt because we're lying to them. Now they look at us with tears in their eyes because they say, your second sin is worse than your first. Isn't that so often the case? Sin breaks fellowship. Sin causes grief. It makes our relationships separate, tear apart, be ruined. It's in marriage, it's in friendships, it's in churches. It's in so much. It's in day-to-day living. It's in the grief of, of loss. Sin isolates, sin separates, sin destroys. And Jesus came to bear that isolation to its fullest. He came to drink that cup, what you deserve, to its very dregs. When we play with the fire of sin, this separation and loneliness is what we deserve. It promises us happiness and self-fulfillment, but what we get is isolation and loneliness. And Jesus understood that more than we do and so he comes and he says I will take that isolation for you I will take that separation for you I will forge a way forward so that this reality doesn't define you doesn't destroy you doesn't ultimately separate you under the weight of hell for think of hell Not as a separation from God. God is definitely in hell. God's the master of hell. The devil's not the master of hell. The devil with his pitchfork is not the boss of hell. God in all of his wrath is the boss of hell. But you are separated in hell from the love of God. From the goodness of God. From the grace of God. That's where all our sin ultimately leads. And Jesus says, I'll bear that. I'll drink that. I'll suffer that. So that you don't have to. So that you don't have to. Because even as our shame ought to fill our hearts, even as we we recognize the brokenness of our own sinful choices, even as we see Jesus hanging on the cross precisely because we did this, we also ought to see that He's hanging there to save us. He's hanging there so that you might be delivered from this grief. Think of that. Would you do this for anyone? 
When your friends suddenly decide to exclude you and to whisper behind your back, what's your response? When your business partner acts selfishly in a way that burdens you, in a way that's in their own best interest but not yours, what's your response? What do you do when people mock and abuse and mistreat you? You certainly don't accept the weight of their misery and offer yourself as the sacrifice for that grief. No, we rage and reject. We seek others and console ourselves. We condemn those that do us harm. But your Savior knows that that will only lead you to utter destruction. And so here He comes and puts His shoulder under your burden, bearing a greater isolation, a more profound rejection, a more universal condemnation, and bears it so that you don't have to. Not that we don't experience the effects of sin, not that we don't experience the cruelty of sin. Oh yes, there are times when people are mean and we are lonely. But in that moment, we always have this friend, we always have this brother who is closer to us than anyone else. We have this Savior who opens His arms to us and welcomes us into the fellowship of His heavenly Father for the sake of His suffering. This is why Jesus is suffering. His isolation is for us in the moments of our own loneliness and grief such an encouragement because He deals with the very cause of our problems and delivers us ultimately by His blood. Delivers us precisely because He's the Messiah, the King of the Jews. That's also noted, isn't it, in this story as we again consider all that is recorded for us. We note that through these verses, in the verses 32 through 44, the echo of Jesus' kingship is maintained, is kept. Notice that in the charge that's above his head, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Notice as well that they say, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And then they say he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the Son of God. And the robbers revile him in the same way. So the title above his head, the words of the church leaders, even that language, Son of God, was for the people of that day a messianic term, a reference also to the divine nature of Jesus, but to his being the, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now to be sure, except for that title above his head, which Pontius Pilate had put there, against the leader's complaints, of course, all the references to Jesus' messianic office are ridiculing, are mocking. The, the people are saying this not because they believe it, but because they want to expose that he's not these things. Indeed, they, they laugh amongst themselves. They laugh behind their hands. How can this dying, crucified, defeated man possibly be the King of Israel, the Son of God, the Messiah? It's... It's obviously foolish. Who would ever think that this man could possibly be the Savior of the world? And truth be told, I think we all struggle with this truth, with this reality, and with this aspect of Jesus' suffering and death. And let me suggest that we, we suffer or we struggle with it because we live in a culture, in a society that values the glorious, the powerful, the compelling Instagram influencers do not tell you the truth about the sorrow and struggle of life. They instead present life in all of its beauty and wonder and make it seem as though there is this perfect life available out there. Indeed, that's why we like to speak of those who are successful. We like to drop their names in our conversations, how we know such and such a person, how we know this individual. We're friends with them because we like the reflected glory that comes from those who are successful. 
Indeed, none of us wants in this life to be diminished. None of us wants to be humbled or overlooked. None of us wants to be put down. Indeed, so much of our relationships in the culture in which we live are to be self-esteem producing. They are to be positive. Parenting is all about pumping up your kids' ego and society's all about saying people are great and no one's bad. It's, it's human nature to want the glorious, the golden, the, the wonderful, and to avoid the sorrowful, the burdensome, the grievous. We want to be affirmed. We want to be told we're worthy. We want to feel as though our value as people is intrinsically good. Respect me. Acknowledge me. Don't put me down. Don't criticize me. That's the world in which we live. And now we come to see a Jesus naked on the cross, suffering in isolation. And this moment of our Savior's death, this moment of greatest wonder, is the greatest destructive power to pride. Because if you are going to embrace Jesus even today in worship now, You're going to have to identify with a crucified, a beaten, a broken, a most humble, lowliest, despised Savior. And think of what that means practically. Think of what it means to be then a Christian. If you're going to embrace this Savior, think of what it means to be Christian. It means you have to expect to be overlooked in your service of others. It means that you have to be willing to be not just second, but last. It means to accept mistreatment when you don't deserve it. It means to accept sorrow and grief in this fallen world. Imagine coming to a church and being told if you want to join here, You have to be willing to suffer. Which one of us would join? Who of us would want to belong to such a company? We want to be told that Jesus is going to make our lives better. We like to hear messages about how Jesus will successfully produce in us all that we want. Material, emotional blessings. Guarantees of of healing when we're sick, of of better mental health, of all the blessings that we need. We want a King who will make life easier. But hard things we're not so keen on. And now we come to this Jesus who is despised and rejected of men, who's hanging completely isolated from His society. And a king that is despised by his world produces followers who are also despised by the world. Isn't this Jesus' own warning? Matthew 10 and the verses 16 and following. He says, take up your cross and follow me. If they have treated the master this way, they will treat the students this way. Jesus warns us repeatedly, the path I'm calling you to walk is a path of suffering. What did he say to those disciples that wanted to come to him? The one... I have to bury my father, then I'll come follow you. Let the dead bury the dead. I've got to go sell my house. I've got to get my affairs in order. The, f- the Son of Man has, uh, the foxes have, have, have dens, and, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus says, You want to follow me? You're going to follow me in pain, and you're going to follow me in sorrow, and you're going to follow me in grief. And now, are you willing to follow and to identify with this suffering Savior, especially in a world? That says, no, 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 no. None of that. None of that suffering business. Let's not talk about suffering. Let's not talk about struggle. Society, everybody exists to make you better, to lift you up. And now you come to church and you meet a Jesus that says, no, no, no. The way to heaven is first the way to sorrow and grief. We forget that sometimes, I think. Sometimes, sometimes we act like Jesus' death 
exists only to sanctify our rebellion. That our sinfulness is nothing to be concerned about because ultimately we have a get-out-of-jail-free card. That is, instead of joyfully living in the freedom of Christ's saving work, putting sin to death and developing the fruit of the Spirit within, we joyfully play in the mud and live in the ways of the world and think it's all okay because I go to church on Sunday and my sins are forgiven. Indeed, if someone challenges us, if someone calls us to repentance and faith, if someone calls us and says, you need to enjoy the saving power of Jesus Christ, then we say to them, are you saying that I'm not saved? Are you telling me I'm not forgiven? You're self-righteous. Your work's righteous. I don't need anything to do with you. Indeed, too easily, we think of the Christian life as merely in or out, saved or lost. Instead of seeing the saving work of our Lord Jesus Christ as a deliverance from the misery that sin brings. But why is Jesus the King of the Jews? Why is He the Messiah? Why is He the one that sits on the right hand of the Father in heaven even now? The answer is precisely because He did this. He bore the weight of our sins because He knew what we failed to. That the problem of this life isn't in society. It's not the parents we've been given. It's not the boss that doesn't value us. It's not the rules that, that limit our fun. It's not the burdens of this life that we have to carry. The problem of this life is the chains that enslave and destroy us and drag us to hell. And our king doesn't sanctify your weaknesses, or your wickedness rather. He doesn't sanctify your wickedness and say, it's okay that you live that way, I'll just forgive you. Instead, He delivers you from it. He frees you from these things so that you may live the new life that you have in Christ, which ought to radically alter our understanding of, of what it means to live the Christian life. Because what's important to a fallen world, things like prestige and success and wealth and power, important because they cover the truth of our misery, personal fulfillment and happiness, a life free from struggles, a culture that affirms everything about me and about what I want to be. That's what our world pursues precisely because they can't deal with the reality of the brokenness and the darkness of life. And so they cover it with empty distractions and seek to avoid the problem by some new and grand solution. But what's important to the believer, what ought to be important to the believer, in the light of the cross, is none of those things. But instead, the joy of knowing that we've been given a Savior whose power delivers us, who, who by His blood washes us clean and by His Spirit works in us a repentance, a, a faith, a joy, a praise, a worship. This is the freedom that we enjoy coming to know our King. And if we know this King, then we ought to walk His path. We ought to walk after Him, follow in His footsteps, which is the path of deliverance. It's also the path of self-denial. It's also the path of willing humility. It is the path of a repentant spirit. And that's not the path of weak and mentally flawed people. It is instead the path of those who see Jesus for who He is and who don't mock but rejoice to proclaim, this is my King. You want to know who my Savior is? He hangs naked upon a tree for my sins, mocked by all the world, and more precious to me than anything this world can ever offer. And when our world mocks us for our grief over sin, our commitment to living righteously, when they say we're narrow-minded, when they say that we're oppressed and oppressive, when the world says we're foolish, 
then rejoice to know this. They mocked your Messiah first. And you are walking in the way of salvation. A way that has been laid out from the very beginning and has been laid out throughout all of Scripture for us. This is our final point, and we'll end with it rather quickly. When we read through Psalm, to the verses 32 through 44, how many Scripture references did you note in these verses? One or two? Three? Almost every verse, actually, in the verses 32 through 44. Almost every verse is just Matthew quoting another Scripture from, from the Old Testament. Psalm 69, verse 21 speaks about the gall, the wine mixed with gall that they offered Jesus. Psalm 22, verse 18 speaks about the dividing of his garments. Psalm 22, verse 17 speaks about the sitting and watching as Jesus suffers. Isaiah 53, verse 12 speaks about the two robbers on his right and on his left. Psalm 22, verse 7 and Psalm 109, verse 25 speak about the bystanders mocking Jesus. And Psalm 22, verse 8 speaks of the words of the church leaders as they mock Jesus. And these are just the obvious ones. There are others that can be included in this list. In these short verses, it's almost as though Matthew just with rapid fire quotes just one scripture after another, especially Psalm 22. And says, if you want to understand what's happening in this event, then it's not just this moment you need to look at. You need to understand it in the light of what God has revealed in the past. That is to say that Matthew is encouraging his readers, encouraging us as well, by reminding us that this is nothing new. That what Jesus is experiencing is not new. For the early Christian believers, for the early Jewish believers, there must have been a profound sense of shame and embarrassment by having to identify with a Jesus who's crucified. Crucifixion was for the worst of the worst. Crucifixion, if you were crucified, it meant that you were bad. It meant that you were despised. It meant that you were rejected. And to have to say that my Savior was crucified must have been for those early Jewish Christians a difficult pill to swallow. Even as it is for us, a difficult pill to swallow and we think, that suffering and struggle in this life is what we have to endure as we walk behind Jesus. So to encourage us, Matthew sends us back to our Bibles. Matthew takes us back to the Old Testament and he says, don't forget, this has long been prophesied about. Indeed, God has been preparing His people for this moment for centuries. Because what Jesus accomplished on the cross was no accident, and certainly not, up a, not a made-up explanation provided by the church for an end that they didn't want to see. That's how the world presents Christianity to us. But the world doesn't read its Bible. The world doesn't know that for thousands of years God had been saying, people, I'm going to send Him and He's going to suffer. Just think of Genesis 3.15. He will crush your head and you will bruise His heel. Suffering is already implicated at the very beginning, the very first announcement of the gospel. This is going to be a suffering Savior. And so when we identify with Jesus, when we identify with the Jesus who rejects sin, who pursues righteousness, who loves the Father, who surrenders all in service to His God, when we walk in that pathway, we're not doing something that's Foolish, empty, meaningless. We're doing what the church has done for centuries since the beginning of time. When we embrace this bloody, this broken, and this crucified Savior, yes, we stand against the world. Yes, we stand against the spirit of the world and everything the world has to offer, but we stand in the way of redemption. We stand in the way of life. We stand in the way of deliverance. For God has promised it and prophesied about it from the beginning. So let us take heart. Let us take heart as we see our Savior suffering. Encouraged to know that when we suffer, we come to a Savior who knows our pain better than we. 
But beyond that, let's see that Jesus suffered to deliver us from our sins so that we might live our lives in praise of His name. For this is the way that God has laid down for His people from the beginning. Let's thank Him for that in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank You that You make known to us the way of life and that You've made it known to us throughout the ages. That we come to the cross of Calvary not for the first time, but having read our Bibles, Lord, we meet this Jesus on every page. And His death and resurrection are not surprising to those who know Your Word, but the very fulfillment of a plan that You set in motion so long ago. When we rejected You, when we rebelled against You, and when You could have rejected us and despised us, You instead chose to to accept that burden Yourself, sending Your Son to die for our sins. Lord, may we rejoice to know that we are delivered from these things. Help us to be free from the world's pursuit of pleasure, the world's pursuit of self-fulfillment, the world's pursuit of self-esteem. Help us to accept and to embrace that in this fallen world, we will suffer because we are living righteously, because we are living sacrificially, because we are living in a Christ-like way. And help us to be confident in that because Your Word makes it clear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Then our song of response is number three.